Good to see all the families here uh, in for the holidays, and uh, it's nice to have family in from all over the place. And uh, thank you for being here this morning. Make sure you give that loved one an extra special squeeze around the arm or the hand, however you like to express affection. Let them know how much you love them. Well, this is the first Sunday of Advent, and so uh, we're Continuing on here, and uh, this message I've entitled, O Little Town of Bethlehem, Are You Ready? There's a lot to discuss this morning, and we're going to jump right in. O Little Town of Bethlehem, Are You Ready? Advent means waiting. We're waiting for Christ's soon return, and He is coming back. You say, well, pastor, it's been so long. Is He really going to come back? Yes, he is. On the authority of his word, he is coming again. In the same way that he came the first time, he will come again. You can be assured of that, so do not let your heart be troubled. And so, O little town of Bethlehem, are you ready? Will she be ready? Will we be ready when he returns? I don't know if you remember reading about this at all. Uh, the the uh, SS Central America... It was discovered uh, after it went down. Many years later, they went down with the equipment they had, and they, they found more than $50 million worth of gold <laughs> as it came up to the surface. I don't know what it was worth back in 1857 when this ship went down, but I want to read something to you. This vessel called the Central America from 1857. She was in a bad state. She had sprung a leak and was going down. She therefore hoisted a signal of distress. A ship came close to her, and its captain asked through the trumpet, What is wrong? We are in bad repair, and we're going down. Wait till morning. Well, the captain, as he said that, with distress in his heart, the voice came back, said, Well, let us rescue you now. We're here now. Let us take your passengers on board now. Wait until morning, was the message that came back. Once again, the captain cried, you'd better let me take your passengers on board now. Wait until morning, was the reply that sounded through the trumpet. About an hour and a half later, the lights were gone, and though no sound was heard, she and all on board had gone down to the fathomless abyss. Listen, unconverted friends, don't wait till tomorrow morning to make your peace with Jesus. He is going to return. This first Advent candle that we light this morning reminds us that he came once, but he's coming again. Advent means expectation. It means waiting. And we wait for our Lord to come again. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. This is where we're going to be this morning. And before we get to our actual text, I want to look at verse 3. 24 verse 3. And this is the whole reason that Jesus goes into this discourse on the second coming of Christ. So Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will all this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? They asked three questions in that, in that one sentence right there. When will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming? And you're coming at the end of the age. It's a loaded question. Now let's go over and find out some of his answer. We're going to go to verse 36. Verse 36. Matthew 24, verse 36. Jesus, as he continues on this discourse, says, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. 
But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. May God add blessing to the reading and doing of his holy word. Whew, here we are, Christmas time, waiting for Christ's second return. Just to help you a little bit, this may help you in your understanding of eschatology or end time events. There is the rapture of Christ that is a distinct moment in time. There is also the second coming of Christ, which is another distinct moment in time. Don't conflate the two. The rapture and the second coming are not the same thing. There is the rapture when the church of God will be taken out of this earth at some time. Some will debate whether that will be pre-trib, some mid-tribulation, some post-tribulation. As I've said before, we believe in pan-tribulation. It's all going to pan out in the end. Don't worry about it, okay? But Jesus gives us these scriptures. So whatever your view is, the tribulation will happen at a point in time, and then at some other point in time, the second coming, when Jesus will put his feet down on Mount Olivet. His feet will come back down and touch the earth, and that is the second coming of Christ. And that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about his second coming. The rapture has already happened uh, in Jesus' flow here. Now he's, he's here to the second coming of Christ, okay? Just have that in your mind as we discuss this today. He says that about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. When Jesus is on earth, he is limited in his knowledge. It's the humiliation of Christ, really. He humbles himself, and he's still God, but he limits himself. Just like when I wrestle with my sons and we, we wrestle when they come home and I have to limit my strength with them because I, I will snap them like twigs. I must limit my strength. <laughs> I, I used to have to do that. Now it's everything I've got. It's called old man strength and I've got about a minute. And after that, I'm done. And so we, we, we wrestle for minutes at a time, days in between. So... Jesus limited himself. When he came, he was still very God of very God, as the Nicene Creed says, but he limited him himself in his knowledge. There were things that he did not know while he was on earth. He knew what the Father revealed to him. And Jesus, it says, he says that no one knows the day or the hour. Now we can know the season. He's given us all these things. We can know the season. We can know we're getting close. We can know the season, but we don't know the day or the hour. We can't give predictions. Some people have pointers. They, they pull them out, and they've got big charts, and they tell you the exact day and the hour when Jesus is going to come. Don't listen to those folks because Jesus himself said, no one knows the day or the hour. That's on earth. That's the natural. But then he even goes up higher to the supernatural. The, the angels in heaven, the intimates of God, they're called, uh, in, in Isaiah 6, the angels of God are around the throne. They hover around the throne and they sing to him. These intimates of God, they are right by God and they don't even know the day or the hour when Christ will return. And then Jesus goes even further and he says, and even the Son of Man, he's talking about himself. The Son of Man does not know, but only the Father. Now, I think that's when he was here on earth. I think that's when he was here. I think he knows now. I think he knows. He's in heaven. It's interesting, Jesus had to grow in things. We don't often think of that, but the Bible says, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, Luke 2.52. He had to grow in knowledge. Jesus had to be potty trained. He had to learn to walk. Jesus had to learn these things. Just like you have to teach your children those things, Jesus was God in a body, but he still had to be taught things. Isn't that interesting? So Jesus grew in wisdom. He grew in wisdom and he grew in stature, in height. Uh, his voice changed. He started getting facial hair. He probably had uh, an interest in girls. He was a boy. Uh, those were things. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. It's interesting. Uh, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and they're trying to pin him down on some things. And in John 8, Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be and that I do nothing on my own, here it is, but speak 
just what the Father has taught me. Jesus only taught what God revealed to him. Jesus did not have all knowledge in his brain when he was on earth. He could only communicate what the Father gave to him. And the Father didn't give him that knowledge of when the Son was going to return. So he only gave to them what the Father gave to him. Everything Jesus taught us was a gift from God to him, the Logos. The very word of God came to us through Jesus. So when we read these words, especially the red letters, that's God's word, all of it's God's word, but the red letters are from Jesus to us, divinely revealed from God to him. That's what it says. Jesus only told us what God gave him. You say, well, I want to know more. Well, God didn't give that to Jesus to give to us. So you have enough. You have enough knowledge to be saved. You have enough knowledge to grow in your faith. And so when you're reading these words, know that you're actually getting the very thoughts of God. When you read God's word, you're getting the mind of God given to you as you read the word. So take these words seriously. That's why it's good to read his word daily. You want to have God's thoughts in your brain, right? We have enough of the world. We don't need any more thought there. We need God's thoughts for our lives today. And Jesus gave those to us as they were revealed to him by the Father. Jesus goes on, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Hmm, well, what do we know about Noah's day? When you think about it, what, what was Noah's day like? What was it like in the days of Noah? Well, we know a few things about Noah. We, we know he lived over 900 years on this earth. We know some things because the Bible tells us, Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on the earth, how it had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. That was Noah's day, and it must have been worse than it is today. Yeah, we live in a, a fallen world still. It's, it's a bad world, but it was so bad that God decided to wipe off the face of the earth all that he had created. The animals had never sinned, but they died. The, the only animals that God created, the only creatures that God created that didn't die in the flood would have been the fish. I mean, that's why we have so many of them. They swam through it. They made it through. They didn't need an ark. This is the day of Noah. 1 Peter tells us in verses 3, 19 and 20, So Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. Noah, Mrs. Noah, the three boys, and their spouses. Eight in all. The Bible says only a few were saved. I guess eight is a few. There could have been 3 million, 6 million, 10 million. We don't know how many people lived on the earth at the days of Noah. Could have been 12 million. If you lived for 900 years and kept procreating, 19 and counting, 20 and counting, you've seen those shows, 200 and counting, who knows how many kids they had. They could have, there could have been millions of people on the earth in the days of Noah. And they're probably just as smart as we are today may not have had the technology, but they were just as smart as we were today. Some say they had all kinds of stuff, inventions that maybe we know not because we lost all that in the great fire. So Noah, this day of Noah, this dirty old day, this terrible day, the day that God grieves that he created people because they're so evil. We know also from 2 Peter 2, 5, God did not spare the ancient world but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher, Noah, did you know he was a preacher? Noah, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the, on the world of the ungodly. Bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So God brings this flood. It's interesting. Uh, he says in 3.6, the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water. It never rained before on the earth. God watered the earth through springs, the Bible says. There was no rain. They'd never seen a rain cloud. It never rained. God took care of them and had springs that came up and they could drink from the springs and the rivers and the creeks, but there was no rain. And so Noah is saying to them, guys, come get on the ark. The flood is coming. They're, you've heard Cosby's rendition of that, what's a flood? And they go through that whole thing. They'd never seen rain before. And so he's preaching to them, come get on the ark before it's too late. They laugh, they mock, they ridicule. For over 100 years, Noah preaches to them. It takes over 100 years to build the ark. 
for over 100 years. And God says, I'll, I'll strive with men for about 120 years. Some say that's the length of a, of a man's life, but I think it means that's about how long it took Noah. He's going to give him 120 years. I'm warning you, you got 120 years, build this ark. If you don't get on, that's it. I'll strive with you, God says. I will strive with you for about 120 years. He's giving them time to get on the ark, but they didn't listen. Hebrews 11:7 by faith Noah when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear built an ark to save his family by his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith <laughs> In Matthew 24:38 Jesus says for as in those days before the flood they were here's what they're doing eating drinking marrying and giving in marriage Sounds like today, until the day that Noah entered the ark and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Those are Jesus' words to us of eschatology in times. If you want to know what's going to happen, listen to what Jesus says. Life's going to be going on, marrying, giving in marriage, eating, drinking, Eating, drinking, Thanksgiving, eating some more, drinking, tightening, loosening the belt, whatever. Life going on. That's what he's saying. It's, 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 everything's going on. Going to work, uh, coming home, getting the newspaper, getting the mail, going in, going through your evening routine. I mean, it, he's talking about just daily living. They had no idea in the days of Noah that's coming. Genesis 7, 16, and, and those that entered the ark went in male and female from all that is flesh, just as God had instructed him. And then the Lord closed him in from the outside. They didn't have a rope that they pulled that ark door up. God closed the door. Don't miss that. Jesus is referencing Noah for end time events. There will be a time that God will close the door and no more can get in. We'll say, well, why wouldn't he want everybody, everybody in? He does. That's why he's giving us time right now to come in, get into the ark before he closes the door. Now Jesus gives two illustrations. Do you remember what they were? He gave two illustrations, ordinary things. He talked about, he said, then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. There's a rake on the ground there. There's a rake in his hand or a sickle. And they're, they're, they're harvesting. They're outside working. Two guys working. One's taken, the other's left. And we're talking about left behind here. We've already talked about the rapture. That's earlier. This is, this is the second coming of Christ. And then he gives the second illustration. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill and one will be taken and the other left. These are the illustrations that Jesus gives to us. What do we mean taken? You can't. You can't bring the rapture in here. This is long after that. This is talking about taking in judgment. Go back to verse 39, till the cataclysm came and took them away. It's based on that imagery. It's based on that picture of the flood sweeping men away into death. They're taken away in judgment. There will be some who will still be alive after the rapture who are followers of God. Some call them the elect of God, the chosen the 144,000 that will be left when Christ comes again, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. There will be some who are here, and they will be, they'll be the messengers of God, and they'll be trying to proclaim. They'll be preachers of righteousness, just as Noah was. And they'll be preaching to people, saying, come to Christ, come to God. And they will laugh, and they'll mock, and they'll ridicule, and then the end will come. But it will come. Folks, listen, it will come. You say, well, it's been so long. It's been thousands of years. He will come. Are you ready? This idea of this being taken, it kind of gives you the idea of the sheep and the goats. When Jesus talks about this, this judgment that takes place, he's talking, he's saying it's going to be like this at the end time. There'll be some taken into judgment. The goats will be on his left, the sheep on his right, and the goats will go away into everlasting fire, the abyss, hell thrown in as well. 
So he says, keep watch. Here, here's, therefore, this is the hinge. I had a, a professor at Mid-American Nazarene that talked. He said, anytime you see the word therefore, you have to ask, what, what is there for? It's the hinge on the door. The hinge opens the door. Therefore is the hinge. He said all this up front, and therefore, why did he tell us all this? He's going to tell us right now. He's telling us all this to tell us something. It's all this is going to happen. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. He's saying this. Wake up, little Susie. He's saying, wake up. He's saying, don't fall asleep on the job. Stay alert. Wake up. Don't fall into spiritual lethargy. And it can happen, can it? Oh, I'll watch that program. I didn't used to, but I'm grown up now, and I won't say those words. I'll, well, now I say them. I didn't used to, and now I'll go to these places I never used to go, and I'll do these things I never used to do, and we kind of get spiritually lazy, and we, we kind of fall into this lethargy. Well, you know, I'm, I can do that now. I've got enough. I've got grace. I've got God's, he's, he loves me. God cares for me. And we let ourselves slowly drift into a spiritual malaise. We find ourselves in this funk wondering, why am I thinking these things? And why am I saying these things? And why am I doing these things? And Jesus says, wake up. Don't go that direction. Don't think that you've outgrown God. Don't think that you've got it all figured out. Stay close to him. Please, folks, stay in the word of God. Stay in worship. Feed your mind with the good things of God so that you don't fall into a spiritual sleep. If you remember Chernobyl, the winter 1991 issue of the University of Pacific Review offers a chilling description of the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster. There were two electrical engineers in the control room that night, and the best thing that could be said for what they were doing was playing around with the machine. They were performing what the Soviets later described as an unauthorized experiment. They were trying to see how long a turbine would free will when they took the power off of it. Now, taking the power off of that kind of a nuclear reactor is a difficult, dangerous thing to do because these reactors are very unstable in their lower ranges. In order to get the reactor down to that kind of power where they could perform the test they were interested in performing, they had to override manually six separate computer-driven alarm systems. One by one, the computers would come and say, stop, dangerous, go no further. And one by one, rather than shutting off the experiment, they shut off the alarms and kept going. You know the result. Nuclear fallout that was recorded all around the world from the largest industrial accident ever to occur in the world. The instructions and warnings of Scripture are just as clear. We ignore them at our own peril and tragically at the peril of of innocent others. Folks, he gives us a warning. <laughs> Don't just silence the alarms. Pay heed. Listen. He says, I'm coming again. This Advent candle reminds us he's coming again. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, are you ready? Are you ready for his soon return? He goes on to say, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. It was about, oh, probably a year and a half ago, I heard something in our house. And uh, normally, my wife, I feel, I feel like her elbow in my back uh, to like, at you, go. And I'm, you know, awakened and bleary-eyed. And I'm going to find somebody in the house that we know is in there. Well, this time I heard something. And I got up and I thought, there is somebody in our house. I could hear them in our house. And I thought, I'm going to go in there. I mean, they can shoot me dead. I'm going in to find out who this is. And, you know, I was tired. I wasn't thinking correctly. So please forgive me. Give me some slack. And so I think, I'm going to surprise them. And so I just, I knew my house, they didn't. I just walked through my house as quickly as I can, and I'm walking over, 
and my son Elijah had come in that night and he had closed the door and I heard that and uh I was going over toward him, and he didn't know what I was going to do. And he said, Dad, 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 it's me, it's me, it's me, Dad, it's me. <laughs> I was going to show I was not going to hold back any of my strength that night. I was going to show him what was up that night. But when we're aware, we can prevent somebody breaking their home. And Jesus gives the same analogy of that he's coming like a thief in the night. He's not saying he's a thief. He's, he's comparing himself to the attributes of a thief that it's hidden, it's concealed, and it'll come suddenly. That's what he's saying. He'll come suddenly. So be prepared. Jesus, or Peter says, 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the light in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. I don't know what that'll sound like. I don't know, elements changing? I don't know what that is, but there's a great noise, and the elements will, will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now, I'm not going political, but I'm telling you that I believe in global warming. This earth, <laughs> that's a bad joke. This earth will burn up. It's going to get so hot. You, so people talk to me about global warming, and I always go to this scripture. Oh, you think it's hot now? Peter says, it's everything you see is going to be burned up. Everything you see will be burned up. All the elements will disappear with the heat. Revelation 3.3, 3, Jesus says, Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. See, he's coming against those who are asleep. He stands in opposition to those who are sleeping. Matthew 24.44, Therefore you, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. I read this story in preparation for this, the Pony Express. Any of you ever heard of the Pony Express? Oh, good. Any of you alive during that? No, probably not. When it comes to being on the alert and ready at any moment to do the job, it's hard to beat the Pony Express. This historically famous mail service between St. Joseph, Missouri and California depended on constant movement and readiness. Relay stations were established every 10 to 15 miles. A rider would shout aloud as he approached the station, giving the station master very short notice that he needed to be outside waiting with a fresh mount. Even when a rider came to the station where he had to spend the night, another rider was already mounted and waiting, ready to grab the first rider's bundle of packages and continue the trip. The completion of the transcontinental telegraph system rendered the Pony Express obsolete after just 18 months. But we have this service's intriguing ex example of what it means to be ever watchful. Jesus used this parable to teach us about being ready. Jesus is going to come back on a white horse sword in his mouth to execute judgment. Happy Advent. He's coming. Are you ready, O little town of Jerusalem? If you are, congratulations. If you're not, congratulations, you're here. Make your heart ready for his soon return. Oh, how I wish I could tell you everybody's getting in. How I wish I could tell you that I believe in universalism, that we'll all get there eventually, just be a nice person. He says something so different in his word. He's talking to believers, and he says, you better be ready. You better watch out. I am coming again. Are you ready? The best time to get ready is now. Corey Ten Boom said, if Jesus were born 1,000 times in Bethlehem and not in me, then I would still be lost. It's beautiful to talk about Christmas and beautiful decorations here in the sanctuary. Thanks to you that helped us to hang in these greens last Sunday night. Beautiful. I love Christmas time. But if Christ is not born in our hearts, it doesn't even matter. It's all going to burn in the end. I don't know what it's going to be like on that day. I don't know what the paper's going to say. Jesus Christ returns. I think I'd take the S off the end and make it ED. 
Jesus Christ returned, and then what? What would that be like? You know, it's interesting how Paul talks about it in Philippians. He says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. There will be this day that everybody who's ever lived will stand before him on that great day and every knee will bow, every knee, believer or unbeliever. They'll all bend their knee. Unbelievers will be saying, Jesus is Lord. Wow, I missed it. And believers will be saying, Jesus is Lord with affirmation. What will be your response when he comes back? Will it be shock and I can't believe it, I'm not ready? Or will it be, yes, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha. The response, interestingly enough, is up to you. In our denomination, we do not believe that God predestined some to heaven and some to hell. We don't believe that. We don't believe in a capricious God. We believe that God says, whosoever will believe can come and be saved. Who will, whosoever, you're a whosoever. And the way to get ready, O little town of Bethlehem, is to say, Lord, come and live in my heart today. Help me to walk as you want me to walk. Help me to talk as you want me to talk. Help me to behave as you want me to behave. And by his power, he will assist you to do that. If this is my last time to preach to you, I want to tell you, folks, I love you. I, I don't have any news or anything. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just saying, if this were my last message, I want to make sure I said this. God is coming back again through his son, and he wants you to be ready. Not everybody's going to make it to heaven. Only those who are clothed with the robes of Christ can get in. Are you ready, O oh, little town of Bethlehem? Let's stand together for a closing prayer. Chase, if you'd come.